Hi, I'm Deepak Saxena. I lead the kernel uh, working group at Linaro, and I'm here with Linus Wale, who works in the kernel uh, working group and also maintains a bunch of subsystems yep. in the kernel at the end of Linaro Connect. I just want to have a quick little chat with Linus. Uh, how was your week? What was sort of your, your highlight? Yeah, mainly this week I've been uh, having meetings with different members and uh, like going over their individual troubles, their process with the open source community, the, some technical issues and so on, and the funniest meetings I guess they have been when we have discussed like a particular technical subject, like for the MMC power sequencing, we had a really informative session and then there was um, yeah, various issues, like somebody would bring me a bunch of code and say like, how are we proceeding with this, like the core site stuff, and uh, that kind of things, like when you can get down in person, just be like two of you or like a group of people and discuss a certain technical subject, that's actually the best part of the connect, I think. Cool, cool. So what was the most uh, interesting technical thing you discussed here? Was it the power sequencing? I would say it's an even draw between power sequencing or the um, core side stuff because the core side stuff, stuff is really, really interesting. Okay. Cool. It basically does, like, uh, for years and years, uh, vendors have used something they call um, in circuit emulation or ICE. Uh, it's usually powered by very expensive tools that cost like $100,000, like the Lauterbach uh, thingy that you connect with a special JTAG and trace connector and so on. Lots of pins that you need to put in your design. And it's basically doing that, but even doing it better than these tools in silicon. So you synthesize a couple of blocks into your silicon and you get all this power to sort of yeah, just dig into the software and profile it or step it or whatever you want to do. Uh, so it's, that's really powerful. Cool. And what about the, um, the SDIO power? I, that's the meeting that I missed, so I don't know the details of that. So I'd love to hear kind of what the challenge is there. Oh yeah. So so basically, like the the problem that we're trying to solve is uh, uh, that these are discoverable buses. When you go out and when you plug in an S SDIO card, it's like plugging in an SD card, and it basically has a 16-bit digit number, which is the the function uh, of the card, and that's a 16-digit vendor ID. Mm -hmm. So these 32 bits tell you what to do with this hardware. That's that's pretty straightforward. It's just like a PCI card, basically. But uh, the problem is that to get to that point. The card has to be powered, right? Mm. And uh, if the card is not powered, you cannot really talk to it. And uh, okay. so it creates like a chicken and egg problem in the right, kernel. Right. We have to have the power up before we can do that. So this one requires that. So is that something you could fix the device fee, or was that one of the options? That was like, uh, we need to do, define in the device tree what the hardware dependencies are. Right. And we're agreed somewhat on using like a slot concept, like there's like a, an MMC controller and it has a slot and then the card, the card is in the slot. Um, <clears throat> but the actual power sequencing will, will probably have to happen in code, uh, given a certain compatible string. So you describe what your hardware is like, what kind of resources you have, but the actual sequencing will have to be done by code. Because, okay. because device tree is really about describing hardware, not describing what to do with it. So would that be driver level code or platform, are we going back to having platform level initialization code? It will probably be a zip link to the MMC code. Okay. So it will live in that subsystem because okay. it's really about that. It's about sequences related to this particular subsystem. Okay. But of course you, you may find the same problem in other places on discoverable buses. Mm -hmm. And then uh, like basically this, this, this intersection between device tree static uh, defin definition of a system and discoverable buses, whether that is PCI or whatever it is, it's, it's sort of a hassle, especially when it comes to the, to the point where they have dependencies between each another. And like the static thing depends on some dynamic thing or the dynamic thing depends on the static thing to have been done before. So that's that's the problem that we're basically solving for one particular problem. Okay. So there's a bigger sort of solution that will probably at some point come out of this that's maybe somewhat generic of you, At least we will have a precedent. How do you track those sort of dependencies? There will be a precedent. I mean, yeah. that's, there will be a precedent. How do, however yeah. you pronounce it. Like, yeah, some, some, something that tells you, like, this is how we solve this one problem. 
then it's easier to go and solve the next. Okay. If it's like a PCI card that has dependencies on power sequencing before it will present itself on the PCI bus, we will, we will be able to draw from this solution and say like, okay, that's going to be the solution we have to have. Okay. And then uh, going home from uh, Connect, what's the thing that uh, you're going to be working on next that you're most excited about? I have some uh, ARM32 things to do. I sent today a pull request to the ARM SOC maintainers to bring in the RealView device tree patch. And uh, it basically takes this whole family of ARM reference designs and uh, bring them to the device tree world. Uh, and I've been working back and forth with all the very little nitty gritty details about the L2 cache controller and such things and which bindings we use for it. Very basic, basic, basic stuff. Uh, controlled by very, you know, uh, you know, since it affects everybody, we have to really get it right. But I sent a pull request for that. And then I will go in and convert, I think, mostly all of the real, real view boards to this new world and delete the, the board files. Cool. That will be a feat. And uh, I hope also to, um, um, yeah, proceed on the rest of the ARM reference design so we can have, like, for these things that everybody else built their products on, a clean slate, like, this is how you do it. And then we will build. We'll feel we are finished with our part of the ARM32 cleanup or migration to multi-platform, migration to device tree okay. after that point. So at that point, will we, will we be at the point where we can basically have just multi-platform configs and not, not need to have per-platform configs upstream or do you think we'll still have per-platform configs in the upstream trees? We will have a few of them. Uh, I don't know if, like, for example, a no number of the dev configs are just for optimizing so you have this one system only and not an unnecessarily big image. Whether we keep these configs in the kernel or not, that's like a, a question of definitions. Like, or like, do we want to keep it or not? We have a multi-platform config that's, that's supposedly going to boot, but it might be awfully big, so you might, might still want to keep the other configs. Right. Then we have the legacy systems, like especially strong ARM stuff. SA-110 uh, is our oldest processor, it's an ARM v4 variant. Uh, then there's the strong ARM uh, 1100 stuff. That stuff is, as it looks today, it's not going to be migrated to multi-platform, it's not going to be migrated even to device tree. Uh, we're just going to keep it around, pad it a little bit, uh, try to, uh, to have it like this nice little cage in the corner, and uh, live and let live. It's like, for this, these really old legacy systems, we have more or less decided that, okay, we're going to coexist. Uh, but for everything ARM v5 or later, let's say, we're going full device tree. Okay. And multiple. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, no more questions for me.